Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this election day, the 6th of November. We all pause to check the weather no matter what else is happening around Alaska. So thank you for joining us right here. And you can always get your latest information anytime by watching the show on YouTube if it's not convenient for your uh, watching on the ARC system or any of your public TV stations around Alaska. Uh, that's uh, easily searchable on YouTube. Simply type in AKWX uh, for Alaska weather or type in Alaska weather show should be able to find it there. Uh, the actual channel name is AKWX TV. So easy way to find it. Just click on that subscribe button and you will be no notified on your uh, mobile phone or your smart uh, device or the email preferences that you set up when the next show is available. It's usually available in the uh, mid to late evening hours there, a little bit after the show actually airs where you are. 1-800-472-0391 is how you find us on the phone, online, it's weather.gov slash Alaska, and by email, if you got a question about anything I just said, or you can't find what you want anytime, please email me and I will do my very best to help you no matter what you're looking for. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov. Here is what it looks for hazardous weather today. We know the West Coast is getting the brunt of this latest Bering Sea storm. Uh, snowy weather there across the interior of the Seward Peninsula along the Chukchi Coast, uh, the Selawik and Baldwin Peninsula region, as well as the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys. In these regions in red, we're talking about another two to four inches of snow on top of what you already have. And with some isolated cases, maybe as much as another five to six, but all in all, uh, this is probably about as bad as it gets for tonight and early tomorrow morning. And as we go through the day, the snow will gradually wind down from south to north. And we expect to see uh, the winter storm warnings gone by about uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. So improvement is on the way, but after tonight and into the morning hours tomorrow. On top of that, there's going to be some gusty winds in the region, anywhere from 35 to maybe 45 miles per hour at their worst. Uh, that, too, should be improving as we go through the morning hours tomorrow. A little bit further south, uh, high surf conditions there for the upper end of the Norton Sound region and the southern sections of the Seward Peninsula. You're looking at uh, surf conditions that could bring uh, waves up about one to two feet above normal high tide in this region. So coastal erosion is possible. We're a little more worried with uh, coastal flooding uh, that extends a little bit further southward into the Yukon Delta as well. So I should have uh, the, uh, the Kuskokum Delta region painted in, mainly from the Hooper Bay area and a little bit further south where we are looking at um, uh, coastal flooding potential in that region, especially around Hooper Bay and northward. There's the potential for flooding uh, with uh, seas coming up about four feet above normal high tide in that region. So we're watching for that to continue until tomorrow morning as well. So a lot of high seas and a big push of westerly wind coming into Norton Sound and more snow and wind the further north you go. So that's the latest on the hazardous weather. You can always check these warnings out anytime at weather.gov slash Alaska. Here's a look at the satellite picture, and we'll notice southeast is looking pretty good right now. A beautiful day if you're in the panhandle. So somewhere in Alaska, it's always beautiful today. That would be southeast. And across south central Kodiak Island into Bristol Bay, you'll notice that strong southerly fetch is building in. We're getting cloud cover moving in fairly quickly, but across most of the rest of the interior, clouds have been filling in all day. Here's that powerful zone of low pressure, adding that westerly wind into Norton Sound and the Kuskokwim and Yukon Deltas. And we're seeing that strong push of moisture and wind moving up into the western end of the Brooks Range. That's where it's been snowing. Heavy snow has been occurring for a good chunk of the day there. Behind that, another surge of low pressure will redevelop out across the western Bering Sea. That will happen a little bit later in the week. In the meantime, a frontal boundary sitting across the northern parts of Alaska is keeping some cooler, more stable air across the Beaufort Sea coast, and there is a fog there as well. That southerly wind, though, is chewing up the leading edge of ice that has been forming and moving from east to west across the Chukchi coast. And you can see the leading edge of that front moving uh, into the Chukchi region right now. Uh, today's weather shows that low pressure way up north just off the map at 997 millibars, a 990 millibar low there just 
moving through the Bering Strait region. And again, all of this tremendous southerly wind and flow pushing that moisture right up against the western end of the Brooks Range and into the Kobuk and Noatak regions and across the west. A little bit of snow found a little bit further southward, but the main issue the further south you go, as I said, is that westerly push of wind. Low pressure sitting across the western gulf, a decent surge of moisture building northward, though a lot of it really hasn't brought a whole lot of rain to south central or uh, areas in southwest just yet, but the rain is building around Kodiak Island and the Bristol Bay region. High pressure at 1,042 millibars has kept a lot of Alaska pretty cold, but clear for a while is on the move eastward, and now it's uh, giving southeast a little bit of a taste of that cool and generally clear weather. That should continue for you tonight, but notice that the uh, pressure pattern across the Gulf is starting to tighten up. And as that nears southeast, you're going to see the winds come up pretty sharply across the outer coast as we go through uh, late tonight and certainly into Wednesday and Thursday. Across the west coast, snow starts to build in a little bit more to the middle Yukon and the Koyukuk Valley. Uh, the Kobuk and Noatak Valley still looking at some periods of snow generally overnight and slowly winding down as we go through the morning hours tomorrow. Through the uh, Bering Strait region, rain and snow should continue there. A lot of warm uh, weather has been building northward, so we're still dealing with open water that's running on the warm side as well. It's a little bit harder to make snow in some of those places. High pressure briefly interrupts the flow, and here comes the next storm. Moving across the bearing on Wednesday, you can see it deepening to 988 millibars. The pressure pattern across western Alaska starts to loosen up a little bit. We'll see some leftover snow across the Chukchi coast into the uh, north and western parts of the state. The Seward Peninsula all the way out toward the western end of the Kuskokwim Delta and the Yukon Delta still looking at some light snow. And we'll see some of that spreading in the northern side of the Alaska Range all the way up into the middle Yukon. But uh, by and large, it doesn't look like it will be uh, quite as intense as what we've seen initially here across north and west Alaska. So here comes the next wave working its way across the central and western Aleutians. Some strong winds with that. Low pressure across the northern Gulf, tightening up that pressure pattern as we were talking about across the outer coast. Uh, generally dry for most of the inside passage, it looks like on Wednesday. You may see some clouds. Uh, but wind and uh, probably some higher seas for most of the outer coast region and maybe a brush with some rainfall while snow begins to form in the northern part of the Chugach and the northern Gulf and rain and snow across southern parts of the Kenai Peninsula with rain showers as you move down the Alaska Peninsula with a little bit more of a northerly wind. By Thursday, that low pressure system is moving into the northern coast. Rain and some wind for southeast, maybe some snow around Haines and Skagway out toward Yakutat and Gustavus, Juno, you'll be right there on that line, so pay attention to the forecast changes as we go. Snow across the Copper River Valley, as well as the Kenai Peninsula, and maybe some snow showers in the Anchorage region and up the Susitna Valley. High pressure's trying to build back into the north at 1,021 millibars, so it's strong enough to shut a lot of this down, or at least start to. But low pressure in the west is responding and deepening to 987 millibars. So we get a deep southerly flow working up the west coast again. We have a strong and long fetch of westerly winds that we're going to be watching very carefully up and down the west coast into Norton Sound and along the Seward Peninsula in the Bering Strait region again because of that long and strong duration of westerly winds. So keep your watch on that. And uh, don't be surprised if you see some more coastal flooding, watches, or high surf advisories as a result of that. A quick check of temperatures tonight, 20s and 30s for South Central, teens and 20s for most of, I'm sorry, that was Southeast for South Central, teens and 20s, 41 in Kodiak, 20s and 30s for Southwest. The interior, high pressure still keeping you cool, clear, and dry. Anywhere from 5 below to 15 below in many locations. Three above, though, for Fairbanks. Single digits and teens for the Beaufort Seacoast. 20s for Northwest, 34 in Nome and St. Paul with high temperatures tomorrow. Mild and windy in the west. 40s for the Bristol Bay region. 46 in Kodiak. 30s for South Central and low 40s for Southeast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On aviation weather now, IFR conditions are expected across the YK Delta all the way down to just about Bristol Bay and over Bethel, uh, northward into the Koyukuk Valley, and then up across the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range, where snow will be continuing in the uh, early parts of Wednesday morning. This should improve as the day goes on. We're also watching for a broad area of convection here around the Bering Strait. MVFR should be fairly widespread all the way down to just south of St. Matthew and north of St. Paul and into the Yukon Delta there. Also watch for MVFR to spread in across the northern Gulf, across a large part of the Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island, and really all of the Alaska Peninsula. As you look at southeast, uh, generally VFR conditions should prevail across the central and eastern interior and most of the north slope. And as we go throughout the day, not a whole lot of change really. Watch for IFR conditions to continue here, but snow again should be 
waning again for the Brooks Range region. Uh, we still expect a, a widespread area of precipitation across a large part of the, the western interior and most of the west coast itself. And MVFR gets a little bit closer to the outer coast of southeastern Alaska with a widespread area of MVFR stretching down into the central and western parts of the Aleutians and a little bit more of the north slope. As we get into Thursday, again, no big change here. This weather system is just creeping a more northward trajectory than an eastward trajectory. You can see MVFR though is spread in across southeast with IFR developing around our northern passes for Chilkoot and White Pass. Watch for areas of convection now to develop across northern parts of the Gulf. MVFR is more widely spread across south central up through the Alaska Range and now into the interior, into the middle Yukon Valley. And IFR is focusing on the Koyukuk Valley as well as parts of the interior of the Seward Peninsula and the Yukon Delta and just down to about Bethel and points just south of that. MVFR remains fairly widespread across the Bering, St. Paul and St. George. Thursday, a totally different plan here. You can see how we have new waves setting up. IFR stretches out across the Bering with some clearing taking shape around St. Matthew. IFR expected across a large part of south and western Alaska up to St. Lawrence Island. And then a huge swath of, of VFR across south central into the Koyukuk Valley and northwest. And then IFR developing across the eastern sections with convection spreading into the north and eastern Gulf. Most of southeast at this point remains under VFR, or MVFR, I should say, but uh, IFR conditions uh, just north of Gustavus to Chilkoot and White Pass and also over Yakutat. So a lot going on again to finish out the week. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to see MVFR for your Wednesday. For Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, marginal conditions leaning over to IFR as the day goes on, maybe starting there around Lake Clark Pass, in fact. Rainy Pass, VFR, leaning over to MVFR as the day goes on. VFR for Windy Pass, Isabel Pass, and Mentasta Pass looking pretty good. Tanita Pass, we expect to see visual flight rule through most of the day, but marginal to IFR, especially across the eastern side for your Wednesday in Portage Pass and Chilkoot and White Pass. About one more day of VFR, Thursday again is going to be a lot different. As we look at freezing levels, notice there's warm air building out in the west, but most of the state is below freezing with a 2,000-foot freezing line riding up and over southeastern Alaska levels for most of the inside passage, anywhere from 4 to about 6,000 feet, over Bristol Bay hanging around 2,000 feet and uh, above, below 4,000 feet around Kodiak Island. Icing potential is focusing on mainly the north slope into the middle interior. South and west levels climb to about four to 5,000 feet, and there will be some areas of considerable moderate. There's a lot of moisture wrapped up in this weather system. Eastern areas along the Alcan border and southeast should be generally okay. Out west, across the west coast itself, uh, probably not a huge icing concern. A lot of this is forming into precipitation. And then in advance of the next weather system, above 5,000 feet, watch for areas of isolated moderate across the central Aleutians. The jet stream is uh, twisty, turning, and curvy all over. You can see this low pressure system here digging across the western Bering Sea, a more sizable area of low pressure across the northern Pacific and right over the Alaska Peninsula in the eastern chain. This is driving that strong southwesterly flow into the Gulf, a ridge across most of the eastern interior, and then Again, a Pacific push at 90 knots coming into the Pacific Northwest. This is driving a lot of our weather to come in across the Bering. You can see that onshore flow generally from the west and southwest for the west coast. Uh, another trough here across the interior, 15 to 25 knots. Low pressure setting up near Kodiak Island. Stronger winds developing around that and for the northern Gulf. Pay attention to that. And 30 to 40 knots across south and east. That is also seen at 3,000 feet. Much stronger winds here across the northern Gulf, up to 50 knots. We'll be watching for areas of turbulence along that region. And a broad southwesterly flow across the Bering Sea, slowing down as it moves across the north slope and the interior about 15 to 20 knots there. So for turbulence, we are watching for isolated severe around parts of the Kenai Peninsula and north uh, parts of the outer coast, considerable moderate widespread across the western interior and parts of the Aleutians, as well as Kodiak Island and the Ak Pen. beautiful days. More, more times you hear these seagulls all the time, you know. But there was none that day. It was spooky quiet. I looked down and there was a box of 22 shells and I said, wow. I reached down and picked those up and I said, man, this is going to be my lucky day. We were just about ready to make the set when we felt this tapping vibration in the bottom of the skiff. You know, if you heard this roll rumble, rolling rumble. We didn't know what it was. If it was severe, 
And it started rolling. And it was just ugh, like that first. You got to remember, this was during the Cold War. My immediate thoughts were the nuke tank breach. It was just awesome. All hell broke loose, and the ground started rocking and rolling. And uh, my little buddy told me, earthquake, run. So we started running. The earth was opening up right across the street, right in front of me. And the black water was shooting up in the air about, I would say, 15 to 30 feet. The top of the foam pole snapping off. The trees were whipping back and forth. And it just kept right on a shaking. And as, as it got long, further along, it was worse. As we stood there on the corner, the first of the standard oil tanks began to explode. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of gallons of fuel that were burning. And it burned and burned and burned. It was light as day that night, except for the black soot that was falling. March 27, 1964. Alaska had experienced the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in North America. The magnitude 9.2 quake left Anchorage and other communities devastated. And although there would be aftershocks for weeks, for most of Alaska, the worst was over. But for many coastal communities, the horror was only beginning. The mega-scale earthquake sent multiple killer tsunamis onto Alaska's shores. Most fatalities occurred in Seward, Valdez, and Kodiak. The channel completely emptied out. You could actually see the bottom of the channel. And we should have realized, I guess, that the water was going to come in rapidly, but we were fairly ignorant of the tsunamis. No cresting wave. It was just this huge surge that came up. And took the, what boats were left in the harbor and basically rolled them around town. So it comes way up in and washed all of that, uh, washed all of the town out down below, just everything, everything. Turned and started running, and, and it happened about as fast as I just told you. When the water went back out, it went down through the channel, just whoosh. It may have been uh, like 20 or 30 knots of current going through that channel. It's incredible. of man in a boat with no oars or nothing. He was just sitting there, just probably just paralyzed, you know. And he was going around and around. Over 30 people died on, on Kodiak Island. Uh, it was relatively sparsely populated. It happened at a uh, time of day when most people were away from the harbor and the, and the businesses downtown. They were at home already. And if it had happened in the earlier, uh, it was lost of life would have been a lot higher. Kodiak's devastation was caused by the main tsunami wave that was triggered out in the Gulf of Alaska. But Seward experienced a phenomenon called local tsunamis, which were generated by landslides in nearby Resurrection Bay. These waves were far more dangerous than the main tsunami, which struck later. Bob Eads and his brother were south of town on Lowell Point when the first locally generated wave hit. The first wave came in way over in that direction that when the ocean was boiling with them big boils there and it went clear over 4th of July at treetop level over there and clear around to the head of the bay clear out to the airport and clear into the small boat harbor and then headed toward Mount Marathon and it took the small boat harbor out Bob and his brother jumped into their pickup truck and tried to escape. I, didn't, I couldn't uh, outrun it and it overtook us and uh, it was under about 15 feet of, of the water. That covered us up and it got awful dark. It was blacker than the inside of a goat, you know. We thought, well, uh, it's uh, just about the end. And then the, the 
we seen the daylight come. The water went down and back out. The brothers miraculously survived, but what no one knew was that the main tsunami from the Gulf was bearing down on Seward. The water just completely emptied right out of the bay. You couldn't see anything. Resurrection Bay is approximately 900 feet deep, and what just startled me looking out there was there was no water, absolutely no water as far as you can see. The bay is 18 miles deep and uh, two to three miles wide, and I could see no water at all, and I commented to my dad about it, and that should have been our warning sign to turn around and get out of there, but we didn't. Coming back into the bay was this big swell. I mean, great big swell. And it, was, it wasn't a round one like it went out. It was combing at the top. And somebody's screaming, get out, get out. Tsunami coming, tidal wave coming. Get out, get out, go to high ground. There was uh, this barge and it had a big crane right at the back of it. It was just like a skier, and he was just skiing right going out of town with this big swell. And as I went around the corner and started up the hill, well, the, the box cars and the railroad tracks and or railroad uh, cars hit me right in the back of the wrecker, and I would say probably pushed me up the hill about 20 or 30 feet. By then, Doug McRae and his family had scrambled onto the roof of their house. It took a while, while. It was like a surf ride. There was power lines that we were worried about getting scraped off the roof. Those tree limbs, and we were spinning and bouncing off trees. And this, this one, I'm, I, I'm just guessing maybe 10 minutes. And we got wedged in amongst some big trees, big cottonwood trees. Power had gone off. The sewers were gone. The water was gone. There was absolutely nothing left in the way of utility. All the docks had completely disappeared. There's just a few, few stumps sticking up there. It's really a mess, and uh, basically for us, Seward was gone because uh, our livelihood was gone, our, our employment was gone, the canneries were gone. And finally I turned to my mother and said to her, well, Mom, there goes your All-America City, and we laughed. And now, marine weather around Alaska. On your marine weather now, you're looking at a plot of sea surface temperatures departure from normal. So take the current temperature now and subtract or add the difference there, find the difference from uh, what is more typical for this time of the year over a longer climatological period of time. And so what we find from our friends at ACAP and uh, Rick Toman's analysis is that warm section of water here across the Bering Strait region south of St. Lawrence Island all the way down through Etoll and Strait into the Kuskokwim Delta and up into the Chukchi Sea. What we do see is temperatures that are closer to normal but all this is under the ice pack so that's kind of to be expected, right? But what you see here is a lot of warm water hovering around the Chukchi Sea, the Bering Strait and the northern Bering Sea and also the Gulf of Alaska. So all these things play into how our weather eventually turns out and course how fast the sea, form, uh, sea ice forms in your area. So where is that today? The Beaufort Sea Coast, really no big changes here, just some minor changes along that leading edge of marginal ice and we see marginal ice still hovering in some of the protected areas along the Chukchi Coast and the upper end of Kotzebue Sound and in the northern end of uh, the Yukon Delta and the upper end of Norton Bay around Norton Sound of course. But uh, we'll see what uh, turns up tomorrow as we get a new look with new satellite information after the storm passes and eases up a little bit. In the southeast now, southeasterly strong going through Clarence Strait and Stevens Passage, gust to 35 there with four to five foot seas. Northerly is coming out of the Lynn Canal, but a much stronger southeast flow coming up the outer coast, 30 to 40 knots with seas building to 15 to 16 feet in the northern end of the Gulf. Some improvement on Thursday, a little bit more of a southerly shift as that front moves in. Southeasterly still going strong on the inside though. Gusts to 35 and 40 knots or so in the northern half with seas four to five feet. The outer coast looking at seas nine to 11 feet. Across south central, north and easterly winds will be the rule. Northerly's down Cook Inlet, 20 to 30, eight to 10 foot seas there. 14 to 17 foot seas across the northern Gulf, four foot seas inside of Prince William Sound. Improvement on Thursday, northwesterly's inside of Prince William Sound with a three foot sea. Winds greatly diminished in the Cook Inlet region, northwesterly's across the Barrens, and seas holding at 11 to 12 feet across the northern Gulf for Thursday. 
Thursday. For Bristol Bay, northerlies inside with 20 knots, 6 foot seas. Northwesterlies down the Bering Sea coast with a 9 foot sea there. North and westerly winds over Kodiak Island and uh, the Pacific coast of the Alaska Peninsula. Look for seas ranging from 9 to 14 feet at their worst with 25 to 35 knots. Uh, winds will shift to more of a south and westerly direction as we get into Thursday. Westerlies inside of Shelikov Strait with a 3 foot sea, 10 foot seas down the Bering Sea coast, and you can see building winds and seas to your west. As we look at the Aleutians, 15 to 20 knots for the east, 30 knots across the central and western chain, more of a westerly shift behind the next front already building in. 35 knots there with 11 to 15 foot seas on Wednesday. For Thursday, the highest winds and seas will be well to your north. They're out over the open waters of the Bering. Westerly is working across the chain, 20 to 30 knots at their worst, with 21 to 22 foot seas across the Bering Sea coast and 9 to 11 foot seas across the Pacific coast for your Thursday. For Wednesday across the west coast, westerlies are still pushing in 15 to 20 knots and you can see 7 to 8 foot seas here out over the open water, 8 to 9 foot seas west of Nunavak Island and out towards St. Matthew, southwesterlies over St. Paul and St. George with 7 to 9 foot seas there on Wednesday. As we get into Thursday, a stronger southerly wind builds in ahead of the next front that's working its way there. You can see the higher winds and seas working their way towards St. Paul, but not quite there yet. 19 foot seas building in, 23 foot seas for St. Matthew, 12 foot seas north of the Yukon Delta to St. Lawrence Island and southeasterlies inside of Norton Sound at 25 knots. For the North Slope, southerlies across the Beaufort Sea coast, a northwesterly flow continues for the Chukchi coast over the open water, 15 to 25 knots with six foot seas there. That's all ahead of the next front. And as we get into Thursday, you can see the south and easterly winds returning with a 10 to 15 knot wind for most areas, four to five foot seas there and 12 foot seas again in the Bering Strait region with a light westerly wind across the Beaufort Sea, Five foot seas around Point Barrow. Let's recap tonight's weather. There's a lot to talk about again. Winter storm warnings continue for the north and west. Some areas may see as much as five to six inches on top of what you already have through the evening hours and then improving weather tomorrow. Uh, high surf advisories continue for the Norton Sound region all the way down toward uh, the um, Yukon Delta. The Yukon Delta and the Kuskokwim Delta under uh, coastal flood advisories there for seas that may be as high as four feet above normal high tide. All of that will gradually improve tomorrow. Rain and wind setting up along the outer coast, especially around southeast. Showers of snow expected for south central tomorrow. And the next round of the Bering Sea system attacks the west coast. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.